Human behavior has always been a mystery. Why do people do what they do? Why do they react one way when we expected something else? How do we learn to understand, connect with, enroll, engage, align with people most effectively? Hi, I'm Christine Kemaford, founder of Smart Tribes Institute, and welcome to our Smart Tribes Crack the Behavior Code podcast. In each episode, you'll learn practical, easy to use tools to better understand and change human behavior. These tools will help your team outperform, out engage, outsell the competition. In other words, to become a smart tribe. Oh, and you'll find these tools super helpful in your personal life too. Let's go. Guarantee work-life balance with these three daily actions. What is your life experience when the workday is complete? Are you spending time doing things that you love or are you too drained to do anything other than recoup before the workday begins? So here are three actions that leaders can do each and every day that will put them on the path towards guaranteeing work-life balance. Action number one, move the needle. Focus 70% or greater of your time on high value added activities. Now, high value added activities are the things that you do that make a huge difference to the organization, are key to your skill set and your greatest talents, um, are key to your role, are strategic, and at the end of the day, you feel really energized and excited, even if you're tired, but you feel like, wow, I really made a difference today. Low value added activities are the ones that drain you, exhaust you, uh, wear you out, and you're, there are things that you really think you should ditch or delegate or defer. Resolve to get to 70% or more in the next 60 days. I would love for you to be at 85 or 90% in high value added activities. You're never going to be at 100. It's just not realistic. But effective delegation increases the amount of time that you will be able to focus on the items that really move the needle, okay? Number two, honor your boundaries. Are you honoring your personal life commitments? We all avoid uncomfortable human relations issues sometimes, but what's the cost? It's exorbitant. As we give our power away and compromise our integrity, we inadvertently teach our brain that not honoring our personal life and our personal boundaries is somehow acceptable. So set up a new system with healthy boundaries and behaviors that will anchor that fact and make it acceptable. Set up a new system. We'll show you on the show page. There are two things. We're going to have the VAK anchoring on the show page, and then we're also going to have energetic weight. Action number three, embrace mindfulness. Do you have a mindfulness practice? If not, it may be time to start incorporating at least one mindfulness meditation practice into your daily routine. And one of the biggest causes of stress is ruminating, repeating a certain stressful thought, like that hamster wheel. The brain sets off down an old thinking pattern and stays there. Now, mindfulness practices teach our brain to pop up and out of that old pattern, recognize it for what it is, a default and well-worn groove that we have a choice to step out of, mindfulness meditation regrooves the brain and builds a new neurological network. Do it enough, like the studies show, and you can train your brain like a muscle to stay calm and present in the face of adversity or the good old daily stresses of life. So go to the show page. You'll see the ROI, the return on investment of mindfulness and meditation in the Beyond Your Brain infographic. Leaders need to learn how to manage their energy. They need to focus on the actions that only they can do to move the needle in their organization, yet honor their boundaries and their personal life commitments at the same time. To do this, wow, it sure helps to be able to stop the world and stop our thoughts on command. So try these three actions and you'll find that your personal life will be as fun and fulfilling as your work life. Our words shape our reality. And they are based on the stories that we tell ourselves about the world, ourselves, and others. This is why reframing is crucial for leaders and for human beings overall. It's a terrific tool to shape the reality that you want. Reframing is a way of viewing and experiencing events, ideas, concepts, and emotions to find more useful alternatives. 
It is a practical and valuable tool to shift perception, including your perception of yourself or others' perceptions of themselves. So this is what's so crucial as a leader is we tell people the reality that we experience, which then helps them determine what reality they want to experience. So the good news is that we can always create new stories about the decisions we've made about ourselves, our abilities, and the world. The result? We change our experience. If we say it's good, it feels good. If we say it's bad, it feels bad. Let's here's an, a business example. Wow, it's really hard to get a job fresh out of college these days. The market is crowded and overqualified people are competing for every single job. No wonder I'm unemployed. It's tough out there. A refrain could be, "Oh, it's awesome that there are a lot of people job hunting right now because it gives a person an opportunity to really bring his or her A game in order to stand out." I'm sending my resume in creative ways to get an interview. I'm doing more research than I've ever done before to prepare for interviews, and then I'm following up on interviews using cool and creative methods. See how kind of meaningful the shifts are that I just went over. One was from defeat, deciding that job hunting will be hard, which means it will be because that's the story the person is committed to, and to a sense of power, can do, creative, and agile in the same way which do you care more about in business success as a team or assigning blame and shame so the net net when you change the story you change the meaning and you change how something feels empowering or disempowering that's then going to change the behavior reframing is a practical tool to shift perception including your perception of yourself things outside of you or even other people's perceptions of themselves or of things outside 12 stress busters happy healthy people know email texting voicemail we're constantly connecting with others so why do so many people feel so disconnected which is a key factor in excessive stress We know stress, change, isolation, exclusion, loneliness is huge for the human brain. Let's learn more about how to connect. According to Dr. Ned Hallowell, an expert on anxiety and stress, there are 12 ways in which people need to connect in order to have full, rich, healthy, long lives. I had no idea how much more connected I could feel until I read his outstanding book, Connect. 12 vital ties that open your heart, lengthen your life and deepen your soul. I learned more about connecting in that book than I have from any shrink or at any seminar. Here's his list of 12 stress busters where we should all be connecting. Now, ask yourself these questions please as we zoom through, okay? So, 12 areas of where we should be connecting. Number 1, family of origin. Do I have strong bonds and clear communication with my parents, siblings, relatives? Do I connect with them regularly? What are some ways I might increase connection? Family of origin, think about those. Number two, immediate family. Do I treat them with love and respect? Are we emotionally close? What are some ways I might increase connection? Number three, friends and community. Do I see friends and neighbors on a regular basis? Do I share my life with them frequently? Do I make time to enjoy their company? Am I involved in community groups and projects? Do I identify with and support the community I live in? What are some ways I might increase connection? All right, next, work. Do I have emotional equity and a sense of mission at work? Do I share a connection with my coworkers and company? What are some ways I might increase connection? Beauty, number 5. Do I enjoy beauty regularly? Do I appreciate it and pay attention to it and savor it? Do I take time to enjoy a favorite art form? What are some ways I might increase connection to beauty? Number 6, history. Do I feel part of the history of humankind? 
Do I learn about it, feel the power of it, cherish the history of my country, town, culture? What are some ways I might increase connection to history? Seven, nature. Do I connect with nature on a weekly basis? Do I spend time outdoors or indoors caring for plants or appreciating nature? Do I have special places that are healing to me? What are some ways I might increase connection? Number eight, pets and animals. Do I enjoy playing with and having a relationship with a pet? Do I value animals and enjoy seeing them, listening to them, interacting with them? What are some ways I might increase connection, ideas, and information? Do I learn new things often? Am I interested in new ideas and perspectives? Am I getting the most out of my brain power? What are some ways I might increase connection with ideas and information? Think about documentaries, et cetera, cool books to read. Number 10, organizations and institutions. Am I a member of any organizations? Do I contribute to their growth and welfare? What are some ways I might increase connection? This could be nonprofits, etc. Number 11, greater truth and spirituality. Do I have a spiritual practice? Do I make time to read spiritual uplifting books or listen to CDs or podcasts? Do I continue to seek meaning and truth in whatever way resonates with me? What are some ways I might increase connection? to greater truth, spirituality. And number 12, yourself. Do I meditate, have quiet time alone, know what matters most to me and live according to it? Am I comfortable being who I am? What are some ways I might increase connection to myself? So years after reading Ned's book, I've maintained these connections to varying degrees in all 12 areas. And my life is richer and more fulfilling than it ever has been. Email texting, voicemail, helpful. Yes. And now I use them to better connect with others. But I also connect offline a lot. How connected are you? How connected would you like to be? Something worth looking into. We all want to be included, to belong to the tribe. And our brains are constantly scanning our environment and our interactions to determine if we fit in or not. That's why the like me cognitive bias is so prevalent because we feel most comfortable, most safety and belonging with people that are similar to us. So who's special and thus included? Now, I'm not going to talk about diversity here because I've done so before a lot But instead, I want to urge you to look at your organization and to notice who is being excluded and why. Sometimes it's easiest to first look at who is included or who's in the in-group. So ask yourself, who receives the high-profile assignments or projects? Who receives frequent public praise, is held up as an example of positive performance or attitude, Who receives promotions? Who has lunch with, is invited to play golf with, etc.? Key leaders. Chances are really good that you thought of a smallish group of people. And I'll bet they all have things in common with the leaders that offer them the benefits I just mentioned. So we're going to call them the in-group. That's the like me cognitive bias at work. And beneath it, We are subconsciously just trying to simply mitigate risk. Now, we're mitigating risk subconsciously because we're choosing people like us that we think will behave like us, that we think will make decisions like us, etc., thus reducing risk. Everybody else, frankly, is in the out group. So your brain has three to four times as much real estate devoted to identifying threats versus identifying opportunities and rewards. Since we are all naturally biased, there's no need to feel ashamed of it. However, there's a very profound business case for becoming more aware of exclusion and how it damages our performance, our emotional engagement, health, happiness at work, and frankly, in life overall. So let's look at your brain on exclusion. 
you've been left out of a group before. Think back to junior high or high school or the last round of promotions you weren't part of or the special meeting or project you weren't included in. You get the idea. You know how emotionally painful it feels. Our belonging is threatened when we are ostracized or excluded and we dive deeply into critter state, fight, flight, freeze. Now our brain literally cannot function the way it normally does when it feels safe and is in smart state. So when we're excluded, our brain will release an enzyme that attacks the hippocampus, which is responsible for regulating synapses. As a result, our brain then does the following, reduces the view of field and focuses only on a narrow span of what it must do to survive. Myelin sheathing increases on existing neural pathways and we are less likely to consider or try new solutions. Our working memory is shrunk so it is not distracted by other ideas, bits of information, or stray thoughts. This means we can't problem solve optimally. Think of students panicked by a pop quiz, right? The information is there, but they cannot access it. We are less creative with less gray mod matter and modified synapses. We experience fewer ideas, thoughts, and information available to bump into each other, so our capacity to create is reduced. We also find increases in the cell density in the amygdala the area of the brain responsible for fear processing and threat perception, making us more likely to be reactive rather than self-controlled. Also, we're less likely to connect with others. Fight, flight, freeze, or faint is not a sharing type of activity. When the synapses have been modified in this way, we appear grumpy and unsociable. So let's look at how we can bring the out group in. And let me just stress, sometimes the outgroup is just an individual as well. So what would change if you started including the outgroup members more? You, well, you'd witness increased safety, belonging, and mattering their behavior. You'd increase collective intelligence, right, which is three people doing the work of five, if you look at our past work on that, because they're all in their smart state creativity, innovation, connection, safety, belonging, mattering, increased innovation from different diverse points of view, right? Easier and more diverse recruiting, a culture of meritocracy that creates empowerment. See, as leaders, we must promote everyone's smart state by not just hiring diverse team members, but by including them. If you're not like you team members don't feel included, they'll end up in critter state, fight, flight, freeze, safe or not, dead or not, right, where no one wins. So the net net, the brain is profoundly impacted when a person feels excluded. And the person, their performance, their emotional engagement, and the organization overall suffers as a result. Leaders must raise their awareness to identify who's being excluded and why, and then intentionally include them. Become a more emotionally intelligent leader in four simple steps. The CEO tells the VP of marketing candidate that he'd hire her if she lost 20 pounds. She's, quote, too fat to represent the company, close quotes. The VP of operations tells her team if they were competent, they would have achieved their quarterly goals. The CFO sends the controller an angry email saying his budget, quote, sucks and is pathetic. What do all these leaders have in common? They aren't very emotionally intelligent. They are sending nasty grams to their teams and causing emotional disengagement and shutdown in others. They have low EQ. According to doctors Travis Bradbury and Jean Graves, see the show page for this research, the link between EQ and earnings is so direct that every point increase in emotional intelligence, EQ, equals $1,300 to an annual salary. Now, if that's not enough, EQ accounts for 58% of performance in all types of jobs. 
let's summarize what emotional intelligence is. There are two tracks in emotional intelligence, personal competence, your relationship with yourself, and social competence, your relationship with others. Let's unpack personal competence first. It has two tracks within it, self-awareness, how in tune you are with your emotions, and self-management, your ability to regulate your emotional state. Social competence has two tracks, social awareness, how in tune you are with other people's emotions, and relationship management, your ability to navigate emotions and interactions with others. So here's how to start becoming more emotionally intelligent. Number one, figure out what you're feeling. It's essential to be in tune with your emotions. This is self-awareness. Now, based on what you're feeling, is it the appropriate time to send that angry email? Right now, it's key to remember that communication is redundant. Humans cannot not communicate. Our facial expressions, our body posture, our vocal tone, pace, pitch betray us. Even in email or texts, our vocal tone, pace, pitch can be detected. Are you feeling mad, sad, scared? Are you feeling peaceful, powerful, joyful? So you know what it feels like to receive an email when someone is spewing anger or venting frustration. You also know what it feels like when someone handles a challenging situation with compassion, a spirit of collaboration, and overall respect and kindness. People can tell. Your vocal tone does indeed come through in written communication. So take number two, take a breather. Holding off on sending a nasty gram until you cool down is self-management. Good. We got the self-awareness. You're going to notice how you're feeling. And now self-management. We need to shift out of the critter state, that fight, flight, freeze, amygdala hijack, and into smart state. That clear thinking, behavioral choice, innovation, collaboration, creativity in order to practice self-management. Now is a great time to unpack the visual, auditory, and kinesthetic cues that triggered you. And if you're in critter state, one of the easiest ways to shift out of it and into smart state is to practice seven, seven, seven breathing. Inhale for a count of seven, hold for a count of seven, exhale for a count of seven. Do this seven times. Now you have choice to respond versus react compulsively. Number three, consider the recipient. While you're practicing number one and two above, consider what the recipient might feel upon receiving your communication. This is social awareness. They're a different person from you, so they'll likely make a different meaning. They'll interpret your communication based on their map of the world and not yours. Many components factor into a person's map of the world. Education, where they grew up, socioeconomics, uh, religion, uh, childhood experiences, adult experiences, which is why we misunderstand one another so often. We all have different maps. This is social awareness. Okay, number four, focus on the outcome. What is the outcome you'd actually like to achieve? How would you like to make someone feel in order to empower them and move the ball forward? It's time to craft a message that will get the result you want and make the person feel powerful, effective, enrolled, engaged, whatever positive emotion you want. This is relationship management. So let's revisit the above real-world scenarios. When I was asked to come in and coach these leaders to become more emotionally intelligent, they had team members ready to quit. Some were totally checked out and no longer cared. Some were downright hostile due to prolonged mistreatment. I had my work cut out for me. Once the leaders were in touch with their feelings and had boosted their self-management and self-awareness, we then worked on social awareness and relationship management. This transformation took four to six months, based on the leader, to become an automatic response. When I asked each of them how they would have navigated the scenarios above, they were able to turn back time. So here's how the communications were edited. Yes, after the fact but better than repeating the mistake. The CEO tells the VP marketing candidate she has great skills and he'd like to explore how she can best represent the company. The VP of operations asks her team what they need to achieve their goals next time. Did she set the bar too high? Were they all too ambitious? Do they need more or different resources? Were there cross-functional dependencies that we all missed considering? 
the CFO meets the controller and works through expectations for the budget, filling in any gaps so what defines success is super clear. The controller feels safe to ask questions and to push back on things that they disagree with. The VP product development sits down with the team, lets them express their grief without judging them. Then she asks what the team needs to heal to move forward, knowing that they'll tackle this together as a team, all for one, one for all. How emotionally intelligent are you? Where would you like to increase your emotional intelligence? Thanks for joining me on this episode. Every listen, every share, every review helps others form their own smart tribes where teams are engaged, happy, and optimally performing. Together, you and I can help millions of people crack the behavior code in their organizations, families, and communities. I invite you to take two minutes and head over to smarttribesinstitute.com to discover more about how to form a smart tribe. See you there, and please tell your friends.